Uh, a little bit about myself. I am. Um, my background is in machine learning, and I started doing computational biology uh, as a postdoc or computational medicine, actually, as a postdoc uh, about maybe ten years ago, nine years ago, and. Um, my uh, work is in developing novel methodology for integrating different kinds of biological and clinical data. So trying to uh, kind of help the patient by bringing in more data about them. Um, all right. So uh, the learning objectives for our module today are, we'll start simple, we'll talk about different kinds of data individually or uh, at least how you could process different kinds of data individually for the purposes of identifying subtypes, for example. And then uh, talk about uh, several data integration methods. And finally, we'll conclude with, with a survival analysis. So uh, clinical data might look like this. For a lot of the cancer patients, you would have all of these variables and more. Uh, estrogen and progesterone levels are somewhat uh, um, kind of specific to, to breast cancer, but uh, this is the kind of data that is now already being used in publicly available uh, predictive systems, which you can find online. So here is one of them. Uh, this is a predictor system, which you can look up from this URL. Uh, ejected today, it still works. The, they have a, the second version already. So you can input the information that it's asking, age of diagnosis, the mode of detection, tumor size, uh, and several other uh, categories. And uh, it will give you a prediction. It will give you a prediction of not only uh, the survival for the patient, but what is the benefit of different kinds of treatment for this patient. And this is done from the kind of the proprietary data and also from the public data that is currently available. So these predictive systems exist, and even using clinical data, you can already uh, build such uh, predictive systems. But this is just a, a small drop in the island of kind of all the rest of the data that's becoming available. So. In my uh, practice as a machine learning person working at a hospital, I've seen all of the following kinds of data. So, uh, of course, genetic data, uh, gene expression, epigenetic data, microRNAs, protein. So this, this, all of these layers of data we have been integrating already, but um, there's other different kind of data depending on the type of the disease you're looking at. So for uh, neuropsychiatric diseases, of course, you will have a lot of questionnaire data. There is imaging data, which now is becoming available in the same kind of uh, realm um, for both cancer and uh, non-cancer, also neuropsychiatric diseases. And also, sometimes you have diet, especially when it's uh, related to stomach cancer or um, uh, inflammatory bowel diseases and things like that. So this kind of data is becoming available. So the question is, can we really integrate all of this data to understand how to treat the patient and to refine their prognosis and diagnosis? So this is a public data which is available if you are developing methods or you want to try out your methods, uh, uh, predictive as well as kind of descriptive and explore, exploratory approaches. So uh, you probably have, all have heard or uh, should have heard of the Cancer Genome Atlas. Cancer Genome Atlas is a phenomenal repository of publicly available cancer data, which has 29 primary cancer sites with five cancers with over 1,000 samples. So with this kind of data, you can already start doing something with more complex methods. Uh, 12 cancers have more than 500 samples, and this is across multiple categories. You can see that in the case of uh, breast invasive carcinoma, uh, over a thousand genotype, over a thousand methylation. So this is the sample size for which this data is available. So this is substantial. All right. Um, why integrate patient data? Well, uh, for one, and one of the first questions that was asked of us, uh, and we tried to solve, is how to identify more homogeneous subpopulations 
of uh, cancer patients so that we could potentially treat them differently from just you know knowing their stage of cancer or something like that and also the second one is to try to help to predict to respond response and not just predict the response but also maybe out of the array of drugs that have already been tested maybe not even in patients but in cell lines how they would uh, the patients would uh, respond uh, give which drug to give to a given patient so let's start simple with a single data type analysis. So this is uh, a paper published in 2005 in PNAS. This is a glioblastoma and glioblastoma. I'll, I'll use glioblastoma in my uh, particular um, kind of throughout the different methodologies. So um, this is single data type analysis, 20 glioblastoma patients. And glioblastoma is a, an invasive adult onset um, carcinoma, which really um, uh, is, is really lethal. There is no uh, treatment. Temozolomide is a standard line of treatment which doesn't work for majority of the patients. It kind of gives them a little bit of a, of a kind of delays the death, but not by much, by several months or maybe a couple of years. So um, this is, uh, you see a graph here. So this is the, the data that people have collected. They collected the gene expression in 20 glioblastomas, and then they tried to cluster to identify those two uh, groups here. So um, on the, uh, each row represents a gene. You can see the gene names on the right. Uh, and each column is a patient. And so what they did was they did some kind of hierarchical clustering uh, for these patients, and uh, they identified as two uh, clusters. And I, I'll talk about hierarchical clustering later, about how it actually works. Um, so uh, not only they found this, uh, this difference according to the set of genes, and then they, they just identified through univariate analysis which genes were associated with these clusters, um, but also uh, these two groups had very different survival prognosis, right? So survival is something we'll be covering today, and you probably have, if you work with cancer, you would have seen survival data already. So um, this is kind of a plot and a little bit of history. Kaplan-Meier plots, uh, they're called curves, but uh, the Kaplan-Meier plots uh, tied to the Kaplan-Meier estimators published in 1958. And uh, apparently they submitted uh, their paper separately, two papers, Kaplan and Meyer submitted uh, a paper each on this estimator. Um, and John Tukey convinced them to work together and submit one paper that's been cited over 50,000 times. Um, so it's one of, one of the very well uh, used uh, tools in uh, kind of uh, cancer for capturing the, the survival information. So here what you see is the probability of surviving for one year in group one is about 80% and the probability of surviving for a full one year in group two is about 20%. So there's definitely a difference, a significant difference between those two groups. Uh, there are also these two there, there are also these dots, more than two dots. This is censored observations, and we'll also talk about that later. So these are individuals for whom, uh, who either fell out of the study or we weren't able to, uh, the researchers were not able to follow all through um, to the, the end. So um, the next, next stage uh, came some kind of data integration. So what people started doing is they had multiple types of data. So here they had uh, gene expression. They had 200 glioblastoma patients. And for those, they had gene expression. They had mutations. They had copy number variants and clinical data. And what they did, uh, they called it an integration, integrative analysis. But what they actually did was they looked at mRNA expression and they clustered patients again um, into this uh, uh, essentially four major groups. Uh, the major groups were tied to the genes that were associated with the groups. So there was a proneural, neural, classical, and mesenchymal groups. But the point was that even though they had additional data, they kind of tried to, to analyze it after they've identified their clusters. So really, the subtypes that they've identified were largely gene expression driven. And it makes a difference. So what about methylation data, for example? So they had methylation data. And if you look at their um, uh, paper, they said 
uh, methylation data didn't seem to be associated with the clusters. But if you analyze methylation data separately, so for example, uh, in this 2012 paper, uh, they analyzed methylation data separately. They had other kinds of epigenetic data, but they have identified this major aberration in methylation, which was uh, in the end tied to uh, IDH1 mutants. So all the GBM patients with IDH1 mutation had a hy hypermethylation, basically across the full genome. And that's a very strong signature, even though the signature was strong in a small percentage of the population, so I think about 10% 10, 10 of their, or maybe 12% uh, of their population, they didn't find it because the groups were identified based on gene expression. So really, you want to have this complementary information uh, integrated together, as opposed to trying to analyze it one by one, and then trying to, to see how one uh, informs the other. So uh, to that extent, several uh, different kinds of approaches have been used since then. So one is concatenated cluster, the simplest one. So you take, uh, you take your data, you put, put it all together, all of your measurements, and then you cluster the patients according to that. Um, second is the I cluster, and the third one is SNF, uh, which uh, we have developed. And I'll tell you about each one of them individually. So concatenation. You say you have gene expression and methylation across patients, mash them together, this is great. The only problem is that you have some kind of uh, small signal, right? Not all genes are informative of the subtyping in the patients. And what you do by mashing it together, you actually decrease the percentage of your signal in your data. And so it makes it harder to identify those subtypes, because now you have a smaller features compared to the total number of features that you're con considering that uh, will give you these subtypes, right? OK. So nevertheless, this was a, a predominant uh, way for data integration in the majority of the TCG kind of broad papers for all the cancers and how they identified <laughs> their subtypes. So this is what they did. They concatenated the data. And then they did hierarchical clustering. So very simply, hierarchical clustering works as follows. You construct a similarity matrix. And here you can use Euclidean distance, you can use correlation, uh, linkage, whatever. People use different kind of metrics. And you can always pick uh, in packages you use, you can use uh, different kind of distances between. But in the end, you basically get this patient-by-patient uh, -patient similarity matrix. And uh, the way the hierarchical clustering works is that it takes the ones with the smallest distance, meaning the most similar one, ones, and it groups them together. So this is, this is kind of uh, a representation. So DNF were the, uh, the <coughs> most similar ones here in, in this two-dimensional space representation, just representation. So they got grouped together. You find the mean. The next most closest to, the, to this mean is E. So you get this merging with E. Uh, at the same time, A and B seem to be close together, so they get merged. So you, in the end, you do this kind of iterative merging until you've merged everything. And this is what this dendrogram represents. So this uh, tree here is a dendrogram that represents the mergings of the different uh, patients. So this and essentially the similarity at different levels. So you can cut it off here, and then you have as many clusters uh, or groups as you have patients. You can cut it here, and you will have only two groups, which uh, you would say the patients in one groups, group are more similar to each other than the patients than to the patients that are in a different group. right? And this is uh, essentially what the clustering does. It's very simple, but very, very powerful. I would never discount it. So um, deciding on the number of clusters, unfortunately, there is no uh, golden, uh, golden uh, bullet. There is no way, uh, no one metric that you can use that will tell you exactly how many clusters there are. So um, what people use, people most, most often what people use. So arbitrarily cutting the dendrogram, like I said, at different le levels, depending on your prior belief of how many groups you are looking to find. Um, silhouette statistic, uh, I will mention, uh, eigen gap, and uh, etc. So there are, there are more that are reviews in this PhD thesis and with uh, um, different kinds of examples. So those who are interested, I, I encourage. But you will not find one 
metric that will tell you exactly how many groups there are, unfortunately. Um, okay, so uh, silhouette statistic, I guess I, sh I should have listed here also, there is a Tipsharani gap statistic, which is also very commonly used uh, as well. So the silhouette statistic uh, basically uh, captures the intuition of the similarity within a cluster. So this is your distances, uh, AI is the average distance to all everybody else in your cluster, and BI, which is the average distance to um, all the individuals out not in your cluster. So this is saying that we really want to maximize, uh, to minimize AI and maximize BI. So um, this is how you compute. You compute this metric for every cluster, for every cluster i. And then, um, of course, it goes from minus 1 to 1, 1 being really a good assignment. Uh, minus 1 is like almost the opposite of what you want. And 0, uh, your clusters are half and half, also essentially random. Yeah, minus 1 is almost adversarial. You, you really did not put uh, more similar individuals in the same cluster. So this is the kind of uh, silhouette plots that uh, packages usually have. Uh, the positive means that all of these individuals are close to uh, everybody else in their cluster, whereas all of these negative individuals with a negative silhouette score are further away from the cluster. And this actually comes with a kind of a philosophical problem of uh, saying any clustering method will always cluster everybody, right? But ultimately, you might have, um, uh, you know, outliers. You might have outliers that really don't belong to any cluster. So um, this, is, this is something to keep in mind every time you analyze the data. And you might, even if you cluster your data, you might not want to go with the result that you see. You might want to uh, check uh, which, which are the individuals that don't seem to belong to this cluster. Maybe they don't belong to any cluster, and maybe these are your outliers and you want to analyze them separately. Okay? So uh, this is an example, actually, that I've taken from um, Hussein Parsai's uh, uh, paper in a master's thesis that he had so, uh, at University of Waterloo. Um, so essentially, these are two simple examples. So this is, uh, the, at least the plots are, I'll, I'll list more. But um, this is one example where you have, uh, in two dimensions, you have three clusters, which is pretty clear to the eye. Here, in, in uh, D, you have uh, six clusters in two dimensions, but the clusters kind of belong, kind of group together as well. So there is some kind of hierarchy of clusters as well. So uh, here, he compared all these different types of clusters. And remember, this is the A scenario and this is the D scenario. And this is the green one that does this is the silhouette metric, which is really the most common metric that people use right now for determining the clusters. And you know that for C, it performs pretty well. For D, it doesn't perform well at all. So um, this is uh, intuitive mathematically, but before you know what your clusters look like, it makes it very difficult to decide what uh, what metric to use, and essentially it's a, it becomes a chicken and egg problem. So that's why people do different kinds of clustering. Or alternatively, you can also do this consensus clustering. So what consensus clustering does, it's also a very simple idea. These people manage to publish it, but people do it anyway, uh, always. So um, this is uh, consensus clustering, and it's even available in R, I think, in, as, as well, some of the packages. And the idea is that you subsample your data. So say you sample 80% of your individuals, you cluster these individuals, and you repeat. You repeat a thousand times. Right? It'll take a while, but on the cluster it won't matter. And uh, then you construct this consensus matrix. In other words, how often do individuals appear in the same cluster? out of all the times that you've sampled them together. So if they had a chance to be in the same cluster, did they appear or not? And there you will actually see individuals who are always meandering around different clusters depending on how you sampled your data. And those are your real outliers. It means that you don't currently have enough data uh, that you have considered, that you have sampled, to tell you whether these individuals really belong to a cluster or not. So um, I propose to kind of um, 
analyze the consensus matrix and find the connected components within the consensus matrix or something like that, cluster the consensus matrix, as opposed to the just doing one clustering and going with it. Um, yeah? Uh, if you use a, a perverse distance, is you still uh, sensitive to the outliers or do you improve the results? Um, <clears throat> so it's not just about the distance, right? It's e to, for the matrix, the matrix will be stable. But once you subsample from the matrix, it means you are removing some of the individuals. So your uh, distance of one of the individuals, uh, let's say it was close to, to this one, but not to this one, right? So if you remove these individuals, now this might appear closer to that cluster than to anybody in this cluster, right? So it's not really about the distance. It's about the stability of the sample and how well um, the density around the, the point that you are sampling. Yeah. All right. So um, a very powerful tool, uh, which also is now used in a lot of TCG papers, is iCluster, which was uh, introduced by Shen et al. in uh, 2009. And this is a latent variable model uh, idea. And um, in some sense, it's like a factor analysis. So I'll just give you the intuition uh, for it. What they assumed is that they might have many different types of measurements. They are not going to lump them together. But they will assume that ultimately, these measurements should, go, should uh, result in the same partitioning of the individuals. Right? So in some latent space, there is some true clustering, which all of these measurements indicate at some level. And so this is what they find. So they find Z such that uh, the, they can project X1 to Z, and all of them will give you the same projection. So it's an optimization problem, and they identify the Z, and then they have the clustering in the end, because Z is what gives you the clustering. So the problem is, uh, with this approach is that even though originally they said that if they have complementary data, they will be able to capture both, they actually don't work so well. I had some simulations, but I, I removed them. I, I don't know simulations of other people want to look at. But uh, the point is that um, this, this method doesn't capture very well if you have complementary types of measurements. So, um, OK, so for the existing methods, uh, there are several problems. Uh, if you do the concatenation, then you remove, essentially, the structure of each of the individual sets of measurements. And then whatever you find might not be optimal. If you use more sophisticated methods, like Bayesian methods or iCluster, then they actually have a limit on the number of features for which it works. So you have to feature uh, or measurements. So you have to pre-select the measurements somehow before. It's not part of their... Uh, pipeline. So maybe you pick uh, most variable ones, but how do you know that the most variable ones are the ones that are really driving the cancer, right? So this is this becomes a, a challenge. How do you pre-select? Also, there are many because of that. There are many steps in this pipeline. How to interpret? In each step, you have to look at the data, and um, yeah. So another problem is if you have, for example, dietary information on the patients versus gene information on the patient, how do you actually combine those together to, to make sense? There are different scales and different situations. OK. So uh, I will tell you now about the similarity network fusion, which is the method that uh, we have um, developed uh, with uh, my student, 2014. So the idea is very simple. Um, first, we construct a similarity matrix of patients, just like you do for, uh, say, hierarchical clustering. And second, we combine these matrices all together. So while, once you are in the patient space and not in the measurement space, the scale doesn't matter, and a lot of these problems go away. So how do we construct the similarity networks? You take each individual type of data, and you basically do your, your similarity metric according to the distance, uh, your favorite distance. So we use Euclidean distance, uh, uh, actually kernelized Euclidean distance. You can use correlation. You can use chi-square distance for categorical variables, etc. cetera. Uh, interestingly, if you think about this uh, patient similarity matrix, uh, 
uh, if you kind of uh, sparsify it a bit, for example, you remove uh, the individuals that are not very similar or that have almost zero correlation with you, it actually is identical to a, a network. So you can think that's why it's a similarity in network fusion, because this network is, uh, is basically a representation, captures uh, what this matrix re represents. All right, so this is a construction of the similarity matrices or networks. And then we use, um, then we combine these networks. So the way that it happens is uh, as follows. At each step, okay, so there are, there are a couple of things here. So the way that it works is kind of like a graph diffusion. So if any of you have seen maybe in physics or this is a common concept. So this is graph diffusion or random walks on graphs, if any of you have seen. Um, and this, this approach just proposes to walk across multiple graphs at the same time. That's, that's all it does. But the point is that uh, what, what happens is that at each step, we try to make each matrix more similar or each network more similar to the other. So basically, we take this network and we multiply it by this network and then we see uh, the information. So we have a resulting uh, matrix that, uh, that has the properties of both networks. So for example, here, we didn't have any edges connecting. And here, but here we had a strong similarity between all of these individuals. So then this information propagates to uh, our first graph. In this graph, we didn't have the connection between these three individuals, but it turned out that there was a very strong similarity between these individuals and another data set. And so this information also propagates. So as a result, uh, we actually, uh, first of all, we are guaranteed to converge to one single uh, matrix because we keep making each network similar to each other at every step. But also, we actually are able to capture this complementarity and remove quite a bit of the noise, right? Because if the noise uh, is not supported, and it's very weak. By noise, I mean similarity that is actually uh, not supported by multiple uh, types of data and is not uh, very strong similarity, right? So all of this noise goes away. So if there is an actual structure in, in your data, it will come out more clearly. So here's an example in uh, the glioblastoma study. So here we had DNA methylation, 215 patients. And for those, we had DNA methylation data, mRNA expression, and microRNA expression. And um, you can see here, this is the actual matrix that we ended up with. This is the similarity between the patients, the real patients. And you can also see that from these matrices, uh, the structure of the similarity is very different across the different types of data. And this is as expected why, for example, if you cluster gene expression, you don't see the same signal in methylation, etc. So this is what we have seen already in the literature. So microRNA actually, interestingly, kind of gives you a very diffuse signal. So it's very hard to, to see if there is any kind of clusterability in the signal. So here, uh, I represent the, uh, the networks that correspond to these matrices. And the topology is taken from, the topology doesn't make, uh, is not specific to each of the individual data sets. It's taken from the fusion, from the final fusion, just so you are able to com compare it visually. So, and this is the fuse matrix. So you can see that off-diagonal noise kind of disappears. There was a lot of similarity, but this similarity uh, was very weak, and it did not get supported by the methylation data and microRNA. MicroRNA also had a lot of noise, but it also was not supported by the expression and methylation data. So it kind of went away, and so the structure became much more obvious. And this is the data, so this, tiny little cluster actually turned out to be the IDH1 uh, subtype from methylation. And you can see that it's supported. Uh, so the, the colors of the edges actually uh, indicate what uh, the similarity is supported by. So you can see that there are very few black edges. And black edges are supported by all of the data sets. Right? Uh, there are a lot more this pink kind of magenta edges that are both DNA methylation and mRNA. So a lot of this uh, 
uh, similarities that are supported by both. But there's, there are very interesting patterns that are supported just by microarrays, for example, here. And if you go back, yes, you can see that there is quite a bit of signal here in the microRNAs. But unless you know what to look for, it's really hard to identify it. That, that is the problem. And here, you can actually start analyzing. Here, there is a pocket, uh, a set of individuals that uh, are supported by um, actually microRNA and DNA mutilation, right? And you can think that when, uh, when doctors make uh, judgments of how to treat different patients, depending on uh, similarity and what they are similar to, their response may be predicted well by their, the patients who are similar to them and not at all, right? And this is kind of what this matrix indicates. Even if it looks like there are three clusters, it doesn't actually necessarily predict or help us predict how the individuals will respond uh, uh, in each of the cluster to the different data sets. To the different drugs, yeah. Okay, so we didn't, and the reason why we didn't, and actually I have this question coming up every time, and the reason why we didn't is because we actually had no idea which ones are going to be more uh, prominent or should be more prominent, right? And the reality is what people say is uh, that I don't trust my CNV data, can we weigh it down? But the reality is that the method shouldn't, if CNV data is basically random, it shouldn't affect the method too much. If all the data is random, you'll get random back, no question. But if one of the data sets is random and the other ones have actually some structure, and some structure that you can capture, uh, the third one should not uh, matter too much. So at the end of the day, if you have a real belief that methylation is more important and is driving the disease, then maybe you want to upweigh them. And it's not very difficult in the method. But the reality is the reason why people want to upweigh or downweigh different types of methodologies is not necessarily the, the reason why they should be downweighted, right? Because we are trying to capture any kind of signal, like microRNA here. So we would have downweighted based on this matrix, right? It looks like random noise. And we would have downweighted, and then we wouldn't have captured some of the similarities that are due to microRNAs. And we didn't know that a priori. So our idea is because, interesting, we'll get a later reminder. Thank you. OK, so. Um, so that, that's, that's my point, is that this is exploratory analysis. And you kind of want to get the most out of your data. And then maybe you'll say, OK, well, it looks like this data is not really contributing very much, so I'll treat it separately. But we had situation, for example, when we were analyzing a disease, and the cytokine data really did not match with the rest of the data that we had. We had expression data, we had clinical data. Expression and clinical matched better than the cytokine data. And I said, wait a minute, what's, what's going on? And it turned out that the, the processing was, was wrong. Like it was amplified, it, it, it was, the weights were exponentiated, and so it looked like there were just outliers in that data. So once we reprocessed that data and didn't exponentiate, took the outliers out, we actually were able to see uh, that it corresponded very nicely with the expression data. So I think, yeah, for computer scientists, it's easy to say, I don't know anything about this data. I'm just going to weigh it equally. For uh, biologists, you might have a prior, and you might want to use uh, some of it. But uh, for exploratory analysis, I think it can be played with a bit. OK, so. Uh, I think I might want to skip that. This is this is just to say uh, that this is the the clinical properties of the of the three clusters. So uh, blue is the the smallest cluster, and that's the IDH1. And it's very well known that patients are younger, and patients have better prognosis. <clears throat> um, the other ones are basically basically the same, even though they look biologically uh, relatively distinct. Um, their survival is uh, the same, the age is the same, so maybe it's something else. Interestingly, uh, the temozolomides seem to have an effect only in subtype 1, which was this big subtype, uh, but not in IDH1 subtype and not in this kind of medium-sized uh, subtype that we found. 
So there's there's definitely more more types of data that can be collected in this, in a glioblastoma, etc. Okay, so we actually applied. Uh, let me show you kind of what we got with this five different uh, cancer data sets. Kind of got similar things, um, but um, so this is the glioblastoma, 215 samples. There was breast ca cancer, kidney, uh, uh, lung squamous, uh, colon adenocarcinoma that we looked at. And even with a s smaller number of patients, which is nice, we were able to find something. So this is the, the clusterings <coughs> in the PCA. Uh, we can, the first three components of the matrix, so this are the clustering of the individuals for glioblastoma, breast carcinoma, kidney, and the corresponding survival curves. Uh, so colon adenocarcinoma was the smallest one, and it seemed to be, uh, to be still uh, three clusters distinguished fairly well. Also, what's interesting and what you should note when you are doing the analysis is that when you have tiny clusters like this, for example, in kidney, renal, uh, carcin uh, clear carcinoma, we had a tiny cluster. And um, we tried looking at that, and then the p-values for the survival analysis were going up and down. And the problem is that when you have very small clusters, if you move one individual out of the cluster, it seems to have a huge effect on the p-value. So uh, the p-values are not very stable when you have very, very small clusters, so you should take care of that and, and know that in your analysis. So um, the, there are certain benefits uh, and disadvantages. Um, uh, for example, integrating, you have a new cohort you want to integrate, you rerun the, the SNF. So that may be considered as a disadvantage. Uh, but essentially, if you have new cohort, it might give you a completely different partition of your patients. So. Uh, this is what uh, you have to do. Um, deciding which measurements are important for each specific cluster is the, the usual. We just look at uh, each measurement and see how much they support the clusters. So uh, we use Kruskal Wallace, and it seemed to work well for us, but it's still univariate uh, kind of measurement testing, which is uh, ultimately not what you want. You might want to look at pathways, etc. So that work is um, ongoing. But uh, the benefit of, of the patient networks is kind of if you don't cluster the patient networks, they are already informative. So they can tell you, yes, I do have, looks like there are some potential clusters, but ultimately uh, my data is more heterogeneous than that. So I might want to stay in that continuous space because uh, to me, I think a network is like a continuous version of clustering. Like a continuous versus discrete variable. Yes, you can discretize your variable, but the reality is that you get a lot more information if you treat it in a continuous space. So looking at the, all the similarities in a continuous space gives you a better understanding of your disease uh, than um, trying to partition uh, the disease. Because in, in reality, in a lot of cancer cases that we looked at, uh, what happens is you get new individuals and they tend to fill out the gaps in the network as opposed to support the fact that, yes, I have subtype 1 or subtype 2. It turns out that the individuals that we get are kind of in the middle of subtype 1 and subtype 2. And this, this keeps happening with a lot of different diseases. Okay. And if you want to use it, there is an SNF tool, package on CRAN, and uh, it tends to work fairly well. Um, but if there are questions, you can always ask. Okay, so these are, this concludes the, kind of the sections of the integrative methods, and I will talk about survival analysis uh, next. Any questions? Yes. Uh, can I tell you about the, the simplest integration approach, the non cancellation? Um, how do you, do you have to, I guess you have to normalize in some way your data types, or do you use a rank based completion metric? Yeah, no, they just normalize just. Standardize variables. Yeah. Yeah. So the way we do it, we would normally uh, normalize the matrix by the sum of the entries, so that they are comparable to each other when we combine matrices. When the concatenation, they just normalize, standardize each variable. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you do run uh, as an F tool and then you get these free classes, how do you go about finding out what was actually, what were the important factors to create this class? Or how do you analyze? So uh, we use we use essentially we take a, each feature and we compare. Uh, we just do a cross call wall, uh, wallace test with the, the clustering assignment of the individual. It's essentially the simplest thing we could do. We also use a NMI, like normalized mutual information. In the paper, we use normalized mutual information, but you can do it with cross call wallace, it doesn't matter. Yes? Okay. So, uh, survival. So, here's what we'll cover in survival. We'll look at uh, hazard rates, not to be confused with hazard ratios, survival functions, uh, a survival function, rather, a couple of my estimator, log rank test, uh, and the Cox proportional hazards ratio. And after that, I'll link it back to kind of the network-based analysis uh, example that uh, that we did. Okay. So survival data, um, as we have uh, seen already, it's a time to a single event. Either death, uh, as it happens uh, in a lot of invasive uh, cancers, or a time to treatment failure, for example, it could be a time to metastasis. It really depends on what you are, what is the very the outcome variable that you are interested in. So, but it is a time to event to a single event. Okay, so um, the uncensored data again. So some data, if the if the outcome uh, information on the patient is missing, then uh, we call it censored and. Basically, oh, we all, to be specific or precise, we call it right censored because we know that uh, the if an event has happened, it happened after our last observation, so it, that's called right censored. And um, also, in a lot of cases, we have to assume that the censoring happened essentially at random. There is no pattern, and the censoring did not happen due to the disease itself. Of, disease of interest itself, that it happened due to some other circumstances. So somebody moving, for example, and not followed in the same hospital. Okay. So this is, this is an example of right censoring. You have uh, days to the last follow-up. The last follow-up is here, but you don't actually know if the patient has died, at which point they died, uh, etc. So you have the information for this patient, you have the information for this patient, patients one, three, and five, but you don't have the information for two and four, and this is centered, censored. Okay, so uh, there are two important statistics that uh, usually are being operated with uh, in, um, in um, survival analysis. So event uh, happens at time t, there is a survival function, and survival function basically measures the probability of person being still alive at time t. And the hazard rate, uh, which is different from ratio, hazard rate is basically um, the probability of an event happening with a person right after time t happened. So this is, this is what it's a um, kind of a limiting statistic where this next instant is right after time t, right? So the delta t is going to zero. So it's basically between t and t plus delta t, right? So what is the probability, what is the, the hazard rate that an event happens right after you have observed the patient? Okay, so to get more intuition, if the hazard rate is constant, it kind of means no aging, not nothing is happening. If the rate is positive and usually the, in cancer, this, this is the rate. It means the older you are, the more at risk you are. Uh, there is, but there is a negative uh, hazard rate, which is actually at birth. So at birth, the older you are, the more likely you are to survive. The, the highest uh, hazard rate uh, for newborns is at birth. Um, all right. So this is the Kaplan-Meier estimator, which come, which. Uh, 
kind of is, um, uh, I've already mentioned. So you have the probability that, a, uh, that a, an individual or a member of a given population will have a lifetime exceeding T, so it doesn't die by time T. Uh, you have the number of uh, people at risk of dying and the number of people that actually died, and this is the, a product of those uh, probabilities, essentially. And that's what this uh, plot is about. OK. Um, so this is the estimator that you are essentially visualizing here. So every, every step in this step function that you are plotting is a member of the group 1 population, of population 1. Um, dies, for example, and that's, that's your steps in population one and, uh, and, and versus population two. Okay? Uh, hazard ratio is a very important measure that people uh, look at when they look at survival. And hazard ratio basically compares two groups that are, uh, for example, different in treatment or different in death rate. And this is what uh, they look at. They look at the observed uh, death rate versus expected under a given model in population one versus uh, population two. So, for example, uh, if uh, the hazard ratio is one, that means there is no difference in these two populations. If the hazard ratio is below one, it means the population one is actually at relatively lower risk uh, than the population two. And uh, if, say, R is equal to two, it means that a population um, one is twice as likely to um, is 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 a twice a higher rate of uh, say death or treatment failure than the group two. Okay, so this is the hazard ratio. Um, I think this is one of the the final things. So another thing that is very very common for a model in the um, Hazard, hazard uh, ratio is the Cox proportional hazard rate. Is the Cox proportional uh, hazard model, and Cox proportional hazard model basically allows you to incorporate multiple different predictors of uh, the hazard rate. So um, you have multiple variables x1 through xp, and each of them contributes uh, kind of log beta to the hazard rate. And this is what you measure. So if the beta is negative, it means that uh, your, this variable has a, a positive effect. It makes it less likely for an individual to die versus um, if beta is positive, it means it contributes to the, to the hazard or to the negative uh, effect of this variable. Uh, H0 is the baseline hazard. And the point of this model, of this Cox regression model, is that you actually don't have to estimate it. Um, and that's, that's very nice. That means that you can only compute hazard rate, because if you want to compute anything else using the statistics or betas, you actually have to know the baseline hazard. And that becomes a little bit more problematic. All right. Um, so I think I mentioned this. So. Um, Yes, yeah, so using and interpreting the Cox hazard ratio, uh, you can look at the probability, you can look at the hazard rate in population one, you can look at the hazard rate in the population two, and these are your two uh, models. If you have the same measurements in the two populations, you can, you actually uh, look at the difference. It ends up uh, giving you an intuition, looking at the difference between the two measurements in the two populations and what uh, the effect of it will be on the risk of a person dying. So uh, in the extreme case, if uh, it, x is equal to, to 1 in, um, and w if the treatment is active and x is equal to 0 when the treatment is placebo, then uh, the hazard rate, and if the hazard rate is, say, 0.8 or is estimated to be 0.7, something like that, it means that it's 20 or 30 percent decrease in mo mortality using treatment compared to placebo. So this is, this is kind of how you would interpret the Cox proportional rate. And I think you will have a chance to uh, practice that a bit in your lab. Um, so you'll be computing that. And finally, 
which is uh, something that doesn't get used often enough, I think, when people do survival analysis, is the concordance index. And the concordance index is basically, uh, it captures the ability of, uh, uh, to, to order the individuals with respect to their survival correctly, right? So if you place an individual who lives longer next to the individual who lives shorter and then again longer, that, that should not be as high concordance index as the ones if you order them correctly, right? So the, this is the only metric that, is, uh, that looks at survival analysis and kind of looks at pairs of individuals as opposed to individual or population-wide statistics. And uh, I want to give you an example of something we did with uh, SNF. So this is a breast cancer example. And this is Metabric data. This is also very good to know if you're working with breast cancer. Uh, they have CNV and expression data. And this was a little bit a while ago when we did this experiment. They actually also already have microRNA data for sure and maybe methylation data as well on these individuals. I don't know if the methylation data has been released, but microRNA has been published. So. Um, they ha but uh, the point is they have almost 2,000 individuals with breast cancer. They have a kind of the discovery cohort is about 1,000 uh, patients, and the validation is about as much. So this is a very substantial data set. Um, the, so the original goal of using this data set was also to identify the uh, subtypes in breast cancer. And according to PAM50, which is a clinically approved uh, classifier, um, uh, there are five clusters, and this is, you can see the p-value of the discovery cohort, p-value of the validation cohort, this is the survival rate and the log rank test, and this is the con CI is the concordance index of, this, of the discovery cohort and the validation cohort. And so you can see that even if the p-values seem to fluctuate depending on how many clusters you have, so i-cluster is another one method that I've mentioned, and there was a Nature paper in 2012, and they have def they called it interclass, but it's an I-cluster approach that they used, and um, they found 10 clusters. And now they say there are 10, maybe 11 clusters, but this is how many subtypes in breast cancer they are. And so you can see that even though the p-values, well, their p-values are certainly uh, lower, but uh, also their concordance is higher, which means the I-cluster was able to partition the population into homogeneous, more homogeneous subgroups where the survival is better ordered than the PAM50, okay? And we did the same. So we integrated these two types of data uh, using SNF, and we tried to cluster the network into five clusters and 10 clusters. And even though you get... Uh, some kind of a more stable result, and maybe the same result as I-cluster with five and ten clusters, you can see that the concordance index is basically the same. Maybe it's a little bit better than the I-cluster, but it's actually pretty much, uh, it's exactly the same, whether you use five clusters or ten clusters. So clustering further, our network did not actually yield uh, better uh, ordering of the individuals according to their survival, right? So the p-values are more sensitive, but the concordance index here showed us that um, um, this, it, it doesn't really matter. So the, this, was, this was done in response to a reviewer asking us, so how many subtypes are there in breast cancer? And basically, we responded that it's the wrong question to ask, because uh, I personally envision the world where you have this big network of all the patients in the world, and you can place a new patient, you can use the whole network to make a prediction for that new patient uh, directly using the whole network, right? So this is what, what's done now. You have a patient, kind of doesn't really fit anywhere, but fits more with a subtype 1. So we group them with subtype 1. We forget all their other characteristics and say, okay, we now use the characteristics of that subpopulation to, be, to build predictors or tell the patient how their disease is going to progress. And that's wrong, because here we kind of forget all of those personalized measurements that we have taken, both biological and clinical, for this individual. Whereas if you use the whole network and you integrate it, one of the things that happens with a network, which is very positive, is that you can take an individual and 
you can also use the information of the individuals that are not similar to this patient, right? Because in a, in a, once you, you group people with a, the like ones, you essentially also uh, don't use any more information of the individuals that are not like it. But when you use the whole network, you actually can use the information on a more continuous basis, whether you like the person or you don't like the person. So uh, what we did was, of course, with the network, you cannot have the, the p-value because you cannot do the, the ordering. But uh, this is essentially the way we computed this concordance index as we added a little bit of a regularization on the Cox uh, model where we said people who are close together should have similar survival, people who are far apart should have different survival. This is basically the regularization that we added, and the optimization is the same, it's just a modified Cox. And you can see that with the same network that we used to cluster into five or ten clusters, the result here is much better, right? We, we changed it's exactly the same data. You have already uh, kind of embedded your individuals into this common space. And using the exact same data, you can improve the survival, the ordering of the individuals according to their survival, just by using this information continuously. So this, this was my um, kind of the reason why I think that networks should be the future. It's just going to be really hard because sometimes uh, the data is not shared to compare the individuals to individuals in another hospital. So it would be interesting to kind of look at summary statistics. What do you need to be able to compare and to build up this network outside of one hospital, let us say. All right. So um, this is kind of, this concludes uh, my, uh, I guess I speak way faster than uh, I expect always. So uh, this kind of concludes my, my portion. Um, what we are looking at now in people who are interested, we've already uh, there is already kind of people submitting papers that are doing uh, simultaneous feature selection and integration, and this is very very nice. And uh, what I think we need is looking at pathways, so you looking at sets of features, not just saying this is a pathway and we look at gene expression pathway, but looking at gene expression methylation, kind of this heterogeneous type of information for. Uh, groups of genes. So this would be very nice. There is a supervised version of a, a network, patient network type of approach where you combine networks based on the outcome that you are interested in. Uh, Gary Bader has uh, developed and published this work, I don't remember where, but recently. It's either on, I don't know if it's on archive or actually in print. Um, uh, it's called NetDEX, I think. Uh, I can look it up now and confirm. But um, there's a, so there is a supervised version. It kind of combines uh, the networks in a linear fashion, but at least if you have an outcome, specific outcome, according to which you want to combine the networks of patients, you can do that. And the weights for the contribution, as somebody has asked in the audience, uh, if there is enough uh, desire for that, we, we had an idea of how to derive it. It's just, it's always, it'll still come from the data. Right, this, these weights will still come from the data. If it's if it's already uh, known how you want to weight differently, it's it's very very simple because uh, you can just upweigh the network right away that when it goes into the method. If you want to know with how you should weight the different types of measurements, then that would uh, involve a, kind of a more um, a different type of methodology. Okay, I'm happy to take any questions. If you have, and we are on coffee. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, questions. What were your external validations set in the process there? Um, are you uh, are you doing anything with your network to change it to tune it when you get to the external validation, or is it completely no. fixed and uh, just being applied like an equation? Like, like an equation, yeah. So. Uh, it depends. For the survival data, we, we had to fix it. For um, generally, it's an explore, explore, explorative tool, right? It's, so uh, it basically combines any data you want. So what we do usually is we kind of derive a classifier to, if we want really subtypes, then what we do is we derive a classifier that would classify on 
kind of we get the subtypes from from the network, and then we derive a classifier based on all the features into those subtypes, and then on the new data set, the validation set that we have, uh, we use the classifiers for the survival. So we have just done it for the medulloblastoma, which is coming out in cancer cell. I just ask that because sometimes in external sets we have issues with the generalizability and the people taking liberty to start fine tuning the model. On yeah, the yeah. yeah it's I a just big... want to know what your numbers were actually representing there. That's the fixed. That's a fixed model, yeah. yeah. It's a model that was used. Yeah. For, for the network. Um, can I just ask, can the model um, accommodate missing data? So if you combine, you know, if you combine data yes. from several different places, if yes. you network them together, can it accommodate missing data? So that's a good point. There are two types of missing data. There is data missing at random, where one particular measurement is missing for an individual, and there is a whole patient missing. For, uh, for example, you have methylation data for this patient, but not gene expression for this patient. So the whole patient missing. So yes, we do have, it's not part of the package yet, but we have uh, basically done the analysis using, I don't know, all available imputation approaches. And what we found was that imputing on the original data does not do as well as imputing on the similarity matrix. So we have several approaches that uh, we actually, it's not even an approach, it, it actually is a pipeline which uh, uh, basically tells you this is the best method for you to use for your data, and this is what you would have gotten if you had all the data originally. So we subset the data to, uh, basically the pipeline is like this, we subset the data to the portion of the patients for who we have all of the possible measurements, and we evaluate the imputation approaches on that, and then we say, okay, so this is the best imputation approach for this data given its, uh, I don't know, characteristics, and then using that approach, we can impute whole patients, well, not whole patients, similarities, we don't actually impute, and we don't propose you don't impute whole patients, because at the end, uh, it was actually a very interesting exercise because you could impute complete garbage, but then the p value would go up, like random. You would impute random stuff, and the p value would go up. So, at the end of the day, it's not um, kind of um, yeah. It, it's 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 not good to evaluate the final product uh, based on the on the say uh, survival data or some. If you have a better outcome that would that's usually great, but there is a way, and we can share the code. We should just make it as a package to uh, e impute on the similarity matrix, and that works fairly well. Yeah. Yeah. So you need some machine Is there? Well, uh, iCluster is arguably machine learning, right? It's a latent embedding into uh, SNF is machine learning. I claim I do machine learning. Um, other methods that are machine learning that do subtyping, there's all kinds of clustering. It, it really depends on what... Uh, for the integration purposes, there is not so much. Uh, there is a, a multiple kernel learning, which is uh, we actually compared in our paper. We compared to multiple kernel learning, and the difference between, for example, wh what we do is somewhat similar to multiple kernel learning, but uh, the kernel learning is kind of a linear uh, combination, whereas. Um, Ours is iterative, and because it's iterative, it becomes very nonlinear, highly nonlinear at the end. Um, for drug response prediction, it's a different question. That's a supervised question, which means you have a label and you're trying to predict the drug response. And that uh, you can, depending on the kind of data you have, you can use any of the standard machine learning classifiers or regression or whatever you want. Uh, to predict drug response. What we are trying to do in my lab now 
That's the kind of work we are doing is trying to build a deep learning method which would take cell line information together with the patient information, how to combine those two. Uh, we actually have a paper on bioarchive that shows uh, how multiple classifiers work for drug response prediction when you just combine patients and cell lines together. But the reality is it's not ideal because what we've discovered is that cell lines, they have a systematic bias and um, combining them together is a little bit like apples and oranges. So we are build, trying to build a better system, again, where you have a latent embedding, where there is similarity between cell lines and patients, but not in the original space. So assuming that there is similarity in the original space actually hurts the performance. Yeah. But there is a lot of work on that. There is actually, for drug response prediction in cell lines, there are uh, reviews that uh, uh, I think uh, from OHSU from Oregon, uh, there were several at the Pacific Symposium for Bioinformatics and the Dream Challenge. They did a whole bunch of classifiers and they looked at across tissues, across drugs, across classifiers. Yeah, so there's really a lot of, but, it, but these are very different questions because subtypes you're trying to discover don't have a label. It's completely unsupervised question. The drug response usually is treated as a supervised problem, or we are now treating it as a semi-supervised problem, where you are use, using a classifier to predict something that you already have observed some outcomes for. And you're just trying to build a generalizable model.